Have you ever wondered what's really hiding inside an old video game? I don't just mean how to get the high score, but how does it actually work? Well, today, we're going to be digital archaeologists. We're digging into the code of a classic game to uncover the story of a computer that was lost to time and then somehow was brought back to life. All right, let's get into it. Our main artifact today is a game called Crossroads. This thing came out way back in 1987 for the Commodore 64, and it was just this chaotic maze shooter where you're dropped into a total free-for-all with, like, dozens of enemies. It was complex, it was super fast, and for the time, it honestly felt like pure magic. But you know, that magic is really just incredibly clever programming. So how on earth did they pack so much action into a machine that had only 64 kilobytes of memory? I mean, that's less than a single email today. And what can we possibly learn by dissecting its code all these decades later? Well, that's the mystery we're here to solve. Now, this whole process, it's not just some dry technical exercise. It's digital archaeology. We're literally sifting through the layers of a digital creation to understand the tricks, the techniques, and the mindset of the people who built it. And we're doing it with tools they couldn't have even imagined. So, what's in the Digital Archaeologist Toolkit? Well, first, you get the program file. That's our artifact. Then you use a special debugger that basically puts the game under a microscope while it's running. It lets you freeze time and poke around its insides. And finally, you bring in the heavy machinery, a disassembler that acts like a Rosetta Stone, translating the computer's native language into something a human can actually understand. And this, this is what the game's code actually looks like to the computer. Just a wall of hexadecimal numbers. To us, it looks like complete gibberish, right? But every single pair of characters you see here is a specific instruction or a piece of data that tells the Commodore 64 exactly what to do. To make any sense of that wall of numbers, we need a process called disassembly. You can really think of it like translating an ancient language. We're taking the computer's native tongue, all those ones and zeros of machine code, and turning it back into something called assembly language, which is the absolute closest a human can get to reading the computer's mind. And this leads to our first big discovery. With such little memory, how do you even make custom graphics for your hero and all those bad guys? Well, Crossroads uses a classic, brilliant trick. It copies the computer's standard text font into memory, and then it literally just draws its own game graphics right over the letters and symbols it doesn't need. Genius! So, using a super powerful tool called Ghidra, we can map out the game's entire structure. For instance, we found the entry point. That's the very first instruction the computer runs when you start the game. We located the IRQ handler, which is basically the beating heart of the game, the core logic that runs over and over. And we even pinpointed the exact address of that custom graphics data. We're essentially creating a perfect blueprint of a 35-year-old program. So this all brings up a really fascinating question. What kind of computer is powerful enough to run these heavy-duty analysis tools, like Ghidra, but is also designed to perfectly run a game from 1987? I'll give you a hint. It's not your everyday laptop. Let me introduce you to the Mega 65. This is the spiritual successor to the Commodore 65, a machine that Commodore designed back in 1991 to be the next big thing, but then they canceled it before it ever hit the shelves. For decades, it was one of the great what-ifs of computing history. And the difference between that original dream and today's reality is just staggering. The original C65 prototype was a pretty modest step up with a 3.54 megahertz CPU and 128 kilobytes of RAM. The Mega 65 though, it's a total quantum leap. It fulfills the promise of that original design with way more power and modern features, all while staying true to that classic 8-bit spirit. And believe me, this thing didn't just appear overnight. This timeline shows the years of pure dedication from a team of volunteers and engineers taking this project from just an ambitious idea in 2015 all the way to a real physical machine landing in the hands of a super passionate community. But here's what you really need to understand. The Mega 65 isn't just a piece of hardware you buy off a shelf. It has become the center of a global community of developers, artists, musicians, and tinkerers, all building incredible new things for it. So just how creative is this community? Get this, the intro disc, which is like a welcome package of software for new owners, has over 264 individual programs on it. That's 264 different games, demos, and utilities, all built by volunteers. And that number is just growing all the time. And we're not just talking about one type of software either. 
This chart gives you a feel for the variety. As you'd probably guess, games are a huge category. But people are also building really powerful utilities, and, this is the really wild part, something called arcade cores, which are hardware perfect recreations of classic arcade machines. I mean, just to give you a quick taste, there's a full port of the classic adventure game Maniac Mansion, a music player for those legendary C64 tunes, a powerful text editor, an arcade perfect version of the game Gapless. They've even completely recreated a much older computer, the Commodore PET, all of it built by the community. Now what's truly mind-bending is how they're pulling this off. The Mega 65 is built around something called an FPGA. You can think of it like a block of digital clay that can be reshaped to become almost any kind of computer chip. So it isn't just imitating old machines with slow software emulation, it's literally reconfiguring its own hardware to become them. It can become a perfect Commodore 64 or even a TI-99-4A. Which, of course, brings us to the ultimate question. Why? Why pour all this creative energy, all these hours, into what just looks like old technology? It's clearly about way more than just playing old games. I think this quote from one of our sources really gets to the heart of it. There's this growing feeling that our modern devices, our phones, our laptops, they're just these black boxes that we don't really control and maybe don't even truly own. And this really shows the two competing ideas perfectly. On one side, you've got the black box of modern tech. Yeah, it's incredibly powerful, but it's also locked down, impossibly complex, and a lot of the time it feels like it's working for the manufacturer, not for you. And on the other side, you have the retro ethos, technology that's simple enough to be completely understood, controlled, and truly owned by one person. So here's the key takeaway. This whole movement is about so much more than just nostalgia. It's about the joy of learning how a computer actually works, right down to the metal. It's about the creative freedom that you get when you know you control every single byte. And it's about the deep satisfaction of truly, genuinely owning your technology. Which leaves us with one last, pretty big question to think about. In our world of slick, sealed off devices, where everything is a service and nothing is really ours to command, what powerful ideas, what amazing abilities have we lost by no longer being able to just peek inside?